Good morning. How many of you were uh, at the BF Homes uh, clubhouse and swimming pool yesterday? Oh, praise the Lord. Uh, yung the Saturday before that. And the uh, first Saturday po. Sige. Sino po yung nakabuo nung tatlo? Ah. Okay. Praise the Lord. How would you explain the past three Saturdays? How would you explain what happened the past three Saturdays? You know, people stood up, opening up their lives to us, disclosing the deep and shameful secrets of their hearts. And there were all kinds of people, weren't they? You had youth, you had young professionals, you had men and women, you had mothers and fathers. Some of us grew up in uh, good families, while others in less than ideal home situations. Some hid their pride and self-righteousness under external morality, while others were pleased to sin shamelessly. Some were conservatives, others were liberal, and others extremely feminist in their orientation. Some were raised in Sunday school, while others were exposed to immorality early on. But they all confessed the sins they had committed against the holy God, the Lord of the universe. They acknowledged their utter inability to save themselves, and they affirmed that they were not worth saving. They pointed to the great love of God through His Son, Jesus Christ. They saw God as one who rescued and still rescues rebellious sinners. They spoke of the amazing, matchless, and rich grace extended by God towards unworthy sinners. So let me ask you, how do you explain that? The Word of God tells us that this wonderful work in people's lives is evidence of God's election. How so? Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 5, For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full assurance. Brothers and sisters, Paul recognized the empowering presence of God's Holy Spirit in the preaching of the gospel. It was evidenced also in the way people responded with faith, being convicted of their sin. You know, the brethren at Thessalonica received God's word with joy of the Holy Spirit. And for many people, they think, madali lang yun eh. It's easy to do that. You hear the word of God, it touches you, it inspires you perhaps, it encourages you. But theirs was quite different because they received it joyfully with the joy of the Holy Spirit in spite of affliction, in spite of challenges, in spite of opposition, in spite of persecution and intense persecution. It is the Holy Spirit. And what was the evidence of the Holy Spirit's powerful work? Was it falling backwards? Was it laughing? Was it ecstatic speech? Was it babbling? Was it mystical experiences? Is it visions and dreams or emotionalism? No, not at all. Paul said they turned from the worship of idols in order to serve the one true living God. They had come to know God's power in raising His Son, Jesus, from the dead. They knew that Jesus was sent to earth to save them from the wrath of God. And they were now awaiting. They were expectantly waiting for the blessed hope of Christ's return. They sought to imitate the apostles as they imitated Christ. They became models of faith, hope, and love for others. And the word of the Lord sounded forth 
resounded and echoed throughout the region. People heard about their faith. How would you explain what happened the past three Saturdays? It's the power of God to save. There is no other explanation of the amazing testimonies which give glory to God and God alone. Brothers and sisters, please rise. How do we explain this? What we do every Sunday, each Lord's Day. As we gather today, we do not seek people's approval. We don't want to please people. What we do want to do is to love, glorify, and honor God. We want to sing His praise. We want to give Him thanks. We want to offer ourselves as living sacrifices to Him, for He alone deserves our wholehearted worship.
exalted far above the earth. His name is high above the heavens. His name is exalted far above the earth. Give glory and honor and praise unto Him.
You are the king of the ages. You are our immortal king. You are the only God. To you alone be honor and glory forever and ever. You are able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or understand according to the power that works within us. To you be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations. Amen. Good morning. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. All right. Before we proceed, uh, may we ask all the children now to please stand up. And I would like to ask the congregation to join me as we pray for them before we send them off to their to the children's church. So, all children, the congregation, please join me as we pray for them. Lord, we are so thankful that just like what you have said in your word, permit the children to come unto me and let no one hinder them, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And so we come before you in behalf of these children who will be attending their classes we pray that they might indeed see who you are, Lord God. See the God who came to earth to save us, to die on the cross for our sins. And so we pray that as they have their lessons, oh God, we plead before you that you will make their hearts not hardened but be replaced with the heart of flesh to receive the word, the seeds that will be planted in their hearts. Oh God, we pray that their minds will also be illumined so that they might understand the true message of the gospel and of the word that they will hear this morning. We also commit the teachers. We ask, Lord God, that you would empower them to proclaim your message. Thank you, Lord. We commit these children and as well as their teachers into your hands now. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Children, you may now go to your classes. God bless you. All right, so we will now go to our koinonia time. But before that, uh, please turn your Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, last week, we noted in verse 13 that we as believers were baptized into one body by one spirit. And I think this is a bit vivid to us because of our baptism, water baptism for the past three weeks already. And the last one actually yesterday. But in, of course, in one sense, we see that our unity as we are baptized into one body by one spirit 
is actually beyond affinity, beyond blood, beyond even preference, social or economic status, race or ethnicity. It is a union brought about by Christ's work on the cross, applied by the Holy Spirit to every believer. But the work of the Spirit's baptism did not just only bring spiritual unity, but also diversity. Parang contradictory, but it is. Paul, expounding on the concept of the body, said in 1 Corinthians 12.14, which is the succeeding verse, For the body is not one member, but many. So therefore, just as one body <clears throat> consists of many parts, so also the church is made up of many members to whom the Spirit gives differing gifts that produces various offices. He explained in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4 to 11, Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. And there are varieties of effects, but the same God, who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, and to another gifts of healing by, one, by the one Spirit, and to another the effecting of miracles, and to another prophecy, and to another the distinguishing of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as He wills. Note, brethren, the word varieties and the word the same in that particular passage. They were the ones that are repeated. And it intimates to us that there are differences in the divine allotment within the church, which he further explains in verses 8 to 11. And these were those given the word of wisdom, others the word of knowledge, and others the gifts of healing, miracles, prophecy, tongues, and its interpretation. Though many of these gifts have ceased with the canon of Scripture being complete, yet we must not miss what the apostle wanted to emphasize. Because in using the word but, which is a term of contrast, he is telling all of us that though there are variety of gifts, it is the same Spirit, the same Lord, the same God who gives this to the church. Since they are all produced by the same origin, they are all intended to answer an important purpose and end in the church. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 7 simply puts it this way, but to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. But Paul explains this further in Ephesians 4 verse 11 to 13, where he said, he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. Notice verse 12, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Notice that almost in the same breath, Paul intimates to us that the Lord gifted the church, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers in 1 Corinthians 12 for the common good, but in Ephesians chapter 4, it is for the equipping of the saints for the work of service for the building up of the body of Christ. And the word equip has the idea of making someone adequate or sufficient for something or some purpose. It is use of James and John mending their nets in Matthew chapter 4, verse 21. 
And why are they mending their nets? To prepare them to catch fish. In classical Greek, it was used to describe restoring a dislocated limb or setting broken bones in place, putting it into condition in which it ought to be. Brethren, each believer is given a gift and he is being equipped in the church to serve and contribute to the building up of the body of Christ. In other words, the edification of the body of Christ comes from the ministry of every believer who is equipped for the task. In one sense, Paul is giving us the divine blueprint for spiritual growth. Brethren, as God has given each one of his children at least one gift, and it is designed not to put it in the ground and to hide, but for us to be prepared for the work of service for the building up of the body, the church. And so today, as we have our time of fellowship, may we try to help each other discover this gift and be prepared or even encourage one another to practice it so that we can all contribute to the building up of God's church. So with your face mask on, kindly get a partner to encourage and to help in finding this gift within his body. Okay, let's uh, settle down and uh, worship the Lord with one more song.
Almighty Father, as a people, we hold precious your word. And so we ask that you might deal bountifully with your servants, that we may live and keep your word. We ask that you may open our eyes, that we may behold wonderful things from your word. Remove the false way from us and graciously grant us your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit, who is our teacher. We entrust to you our hearts. And we pray, dear God, that our hearts will be fertile for the planting of your most precious word. And for that which you shall accomplish in our time of study, we give you back all honor and glory. In Christ's name. Good morning. Today's study takes us back to what we started to take up in the 12th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. We are grateful to God for the Holy Spirit, our divine teacher, for the truth we have been taught as we journey through this wonderful Gospel. But as I mentioned last week, we come to another challenging part of the narrative. Recall that we liken this passage to a power saw where we need to get a firm grip and move gingerly lest we sever a couple of fingers. I'm trusting that if you were here last Sunday in, San, in last Sunday's lesson, you would remember what I mean by that. As I explained, if we handle this matter before us carelessly, like a power saw, somebody is bound to get hurt. I'm talking about the topic, the unpardonable sin of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. So please open your Bibles to Matthew 12. Let's read from verses 31 to 37. Again, from the NASB. Therefore I say to you, any, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people. But blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. The good man brings out of his good treasure what is good, and the evil man brings out of the, his evil treasure what is evil. But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. This passage is nestled in the growing and intensifying opposition against Jesus Christ. And the Lord was certainly aware of this even before he inaugurated his public ministry. Recall that during his infancy, King Herod attempted to have him killed. When the Lord embarked on his public ministry many years later, people were initially thrilled to listen to his teachings and marveled at his amazing miracles. But the religious leaders were not excited by what they saw. Thus, there were intermittent clashes between these men and the Lord Jesus. So as far as Matthew's narrative is concerned, these clashes set the stage for the ultimate alliance between the Jewish leaders and the Roman overlords to murder the Lord Jesus. But in our study last week of verses 22 to 30, we noted that Matthew allows his readers to take a peek behind the curtain, as it were, to reveal a dimension of this conflict that is often overlooked, and that is the force of evil and darkness led by the devil. Hence, Matthew relates another incident where the Lord confronted demons that had possessed a poor man. Bear in mind that the Lord's power over demons had already been displayed 
in the previous chapters. You recall that, of course. So the incident reported here in verse 22 is not a new phenomenon. They've seen the Lord cast out demons before. But in light of the decision of the Pharisees to have Jesus killed or destroyed, as reported in verse 14 of the same chapter, I believe Matthew wanted to remind his readers that the devil was also involved. Sure, the Pharisees were offended when the Lord Jesus did not follow their standards with respect to observing the Sabbath. The religious leaders were also incensed that Jesus pronounced that he was greater than King David and greater than the temple. To be sure, they were culpable for their own decisions. But the devil's part cannot be overlooked. Thus, the Lord performed another amazing miracle before the crowd. And Matthew now underscores that even if Satan was part of the plot against the Lord Jesus, God's power easily set the possessed man free. The truth is, the people had just witnessed a clash between two kingdoms, the kingdom of darkness headed by Satan and the kingdom of light headed by King Jesus. And in that clash, the Lord proved beyond doubt that the kingdom of light was and is forever superior. Now with a miracle of healing of this demonized individual happening before their very eyes, the Pharisees understood that it would be foolish to deny that the Lord had spirit, uh, that the Lord had spiritual power. They could not say that what the Lord did was merely a hat trick. Therefore, their only option was to discredit the Lord to claim that his spiritual power came from the dark side. The Pharisees felt that this was especially necessary at that moment because Matthew talks, uh, tells us that uh, all the people, all the crowds were amazed and were saying, this man cannot be the son of David, can he? Right there in verse 23. They, re they realized that people were beginning to think that Jesus might be the son of David or the Messiah. Now, as we saw last week, the Lord Jesus quickly dismantled their false accusations from verses 25 to 29. But he also pointed out that since his miracles, that since his miracle work was certainly not of the devil, then they should realize that he is of God and that the kingdom of God has come upon them. As we explained, the kingdom of God has two faces. The first face is the invisible internal kingdom of God. This refers to the kingdom which Christ, wherein Christ reigns in the heart of a person who has accepted Jesus as Savior and Lord. It comes by way of the new birth. The second phase is the future and in, invisible messianic age or messianic kingdom. Even from the perspective of this present time, it is still future. And it will take the Lord's return to bring this kingdom about. Now, the Lord knew that it was this second phase of the kingdom that the Jews at that time were looking for. But when the Lord said that the kingdom has, has come upon you, he was not referring to the future phase of the kingdom. He was not referring to the messianic kingdom. In fact, his ministry and that of the apostles had been announcing how a person could enter the invisible aspect of the kingdom, how people could, uh, could discover the new birth. And in that way, those who receive this internal invisible kingdom by way of the new birth where Christ Jesus reigns are assured of experiencing the visible kingdom in the future. This kingdom, of course, is established in a person's heart. Therefore, the Lord Jesus calls the people for a clear response. Right there in verse 30, he who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. 
the Lord states clearly that there are only two forces at work here, the gathering and the scattering. Therefore, the Lord will not tolerate neutrality. In fact, his statement here infers that neutrality is no neutrality, but a remaining on the side of the enemy. Indolence is not merely indolence, but opposition as far as Jesus Christ is concerned. So, from verses 22 to 30, Matthew reports that the Lord issued two rebuttals, right there in verses 25 to 29, to the false accusation of the Pharisees, and one choice, verse 30. And in verses 31 to 32, the Lord issues a warning. So here you have two rebuttals, one choice to be made, and a warning. Let's read verse 31 again. Therefore I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man it shall be forgiven him either in this age or in the age to come. In this passage, we have the ultimate antithesis in which uh, antithesis, uh, we have the ultimate antithesis of sin which is forgivable and sin which is unforgivable. The word antithesis means exact opposite. And describes a situation where two opposites are introduced in the same sentence for contrasting effect. And in verse 31, we have the ultimate good news, bad news. The good news is that any, or literally in the Greek it means all, so any and all sin we have committed, no matter how heinous, no matter how depraved, no matter how wicked, no matter how long in the duration, etc., is forgivable. This is good news, therefore, for everyone because it flings the doors of the kingdom of God open so that anyone may enter through the gates of the gospel. Now, take note that the Lord even adds the sin of blasphemy to leave no doubt that it too can be forgiven, right? And by doing this, it will allow the Lord to more strongly bring out the one exception. Now, the but, the word but in verse 31 introduces a striking contrast of the bad news of a sin which cannot be forgiven, and that is the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So the question everybody asks is this, what is this unforgivable sin against the Spirit? There is some disagreement among Bible scholars regarding this sin. Some say this exact sin cannot be committed in our day. Why do they say that? Well, they reason that this sin specifically was a slanderous accusation against Jesus, specifically accusing him of performing miracles by the power of Satan rather than the, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And since the Lord Jesus is not physically present and not casting out demons and healing the lame, curing lepers, etc., then this exact sin cannot be committed in our day because the men who committed it witnessed these miracles. Because Jesus is no longer here. The question then arises, does Jesus' Jesus' warning have any application to men today since he's no longer here? Is there any way a person can blaspheme the Holy Spirit today or commit this unpardonable sin? The phrase sounds ominous 
and strange so that it deserves careful consideration. So let me point out first a few things. First and foremost, if you are worried that you have committed this sin, then you can be sure that you have not. All right? The fact that you, that you have a conscious conviction or awareness of your sin is evidence that you have not committed this unpardonable sin. So, you can breathe a sigh of relief. Your eternity is not yet doomed. Dale Moody told the story of an aged minister who believed he had committed an unpardonable sin. After much inner turmoil, he gave in to what he mistakenly thought to be God's will. And that is for him to be lost because he felt that he had committed the unpardonable sin against the Holy Spirit. Then something within him whispered, maybe it was his reasoning, maybe it was God through his providence. Something within him whispered, suppose there is a hell for you. What would you, with your disposition, do there? The quick answer was, I would set up a prayer meeting. <laughs> with those words came the light of God to show the absurdity of his fears. He had not committed the unpardonable sin. The very fact that he feared he had committed this sin plus his deep concern proved that he had not. Second, the unpardonable sin cannot be an ordinary sin, nor can it simply be a repeated sin. Let us suppose that a husband, wala po akong pinasatamaan dito, who professed to be a Christian, promises his wife that he would be home for dinner on certain nights. But he could not say no to his boss and office mates for a nightcap almost every other night. And because he's hoping to get a promotion, he always, he's always trying to get on the good side of his boss, sometimes even on weekends. So when he comes to church Sunday morning, he's mostly asleep in, in the congregation. Now that is the unpardonable sin. <laughs> All right, I have to be clear on that. That's the unpardonable sin as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So he's mostly asleep Sunday morning in, through the, in church or on his phone. And then he rushes his family out of the church so, they, so that they can grab a quick lunch, and he can go out to, to play bowling with his former classmates or his boss or whoever. Now, this goes on week after week, even after many arguments with his wife and many promises that he would reform his ways. To be sure, the man has sinned against his wife and family and against God's instruction with respect to leading his family. Question. Has this man committed the unpardonable sin? Well, perhaps to that, his wife will say, yes! <laughs> but kidding aside, no, he has not. Even if this man committed the same sin every week, his acts are forgivable because even repeated sins can be absolved. We all agree that some sins offend more than others. For example, personally, I find it infuriating when someone lies. But an infuriating sin, and even the more terrible sins, like slander, theft, adultery, murder, these sins can be forgiven. These sins may be appalling and unspeakable, but they fall under, quote-unquote, and for lack of a better term, ordinary sins. So if a sinner is guilty of committing sins like this, but genuinely repents and believes in Christ's saving work, the Lord will be merciful and will forgive. Again, and as we, and as we quoted last week, 1 John 1 verse 9 assures 
us, if we confess our sins, He is righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Therefore, when the Lord Jesus says, Blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven, we realize there must be something extraordinary about that sin. Apparently, the Pharisees had not committed, committed it yet when they blasphemed Jesus. But they came close enough that the Lord Jesus issued a solemn warning. Calling the Lord's wonderful miracle of exorcising the demon from this poor blind and mute man, the work of Satan was truly blasphemy. And there is no denying that the Pharisees, what the Pharisees did was serious. Yet, we must take note that Jesus distinguished what they did from blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which cannot be forgiven. Now third, I would like to point out that the distinction between blasphemy against Jesus, which is forgivable, and blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which is unforgivable, rests upon the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit convicts of sin, and testifies that Jesus is the Son of God and Savior. Jesus teaches that someone can reject Him, and God will forgive him if he repents and believes. You see, the Lord understood that the Pharisees did not know what they were doing, as He said on the cross, right? Sins of ignorance, however severe, are pardonable. Remember, Paul blasphemed and persecuted the church, but God had mercy on him because he sinned in ignorance, right? Thus, Paul even wrote in 1 Timothy 1, verses 12 to 14, he said, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor yet i was shown mercy because i acted ignorantly he says in unbelief so sins of ignorance however severe are pardonable so paul admits that he was a blasphemer in his ignorance as an unbeliever and it was through the mercy of god that he received divine forgiveness this is good news that the greatest apostle in the history of the church is a forgiven blasphemer. But as defiant and irreverent as blasphemy against God is, it is nevertheless forgivable by our merciful, gracious, and forgiving God. That, my friends, is called amazing grace. Recall also that Peter, the leading apostle of the twelve, blasphemed, right? Denying Christ three times and even began to curse and swear. God forgives blasphemers, whether we are overt as Paul or repetitive as Peter. And the truth is, we have all slandered the beautiful name of Jesus and God, and yet He has forgiven us. Now, fourth, and more importantly, the blasphemy against the Spirit is the sober, clear-minded, deliberate rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ, despite full knowledge of His work in the face of the Spirit's full testimony to Him. To put it another way, it is the sin of continually resisting the convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit who shows us that we are sinners and in need of the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. For example, if an unbelieving person is lying on his deathbed and the family is pleading with him to accept Jesus Christ as Savior before he dies, and he refuses to the very end of his life 
and even blasphemes the Lord. Clearly, his sins are unpardonable. This blasphemer has heard the gospel proclaimed with clarity and power. He has watched Christians live good and Christ-honoring lives. Yet he hates Jesus and Christianity and views it as wickedness and deceit. He hears, he understands, yet he despises. This sin is not exactly the same as the scribes and the Pharisees committed, but the, same, the effect is the same. Eternal death. In a similar manner, if a person repeatedly offered the gospel and steadfastly and stubbornly continues to refuse it, so if a person is repeatedly offered the gospel and yet he remains hard-hearted, refusing it, even disparagingly refusing it, there comes a point in time known only to God, all right? when the person is no longer able to come to salvation. And we see why this sin is deemed unpardonable. How can one turn to Christ and be saved when he has seen all the evidence and rejected it as a terrible evil? We see this scenario in even uh, explained in Hebrews 6, verses 4 to 6. It says, For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucified to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. I realize that Hebrews 6 is a rather difficult and controversial passage. I know the issues there. But I interpret this as those who were given opportunity to believe and yet chose to willfully reject the spirits wooing them to Jesus to be their Savior. Even after clear exposure and experience of the grace of God, these individuals have crossed a line, which I believe, and I stressed earlier, only God knows, and can no longer come to repentance and pardon for their sins because they have crossed that line. They have, in essence, become unpardonable. Joseph Addison Alexander was a well-respected theologian in the 1800s who penned a poem that alludes to the line a person can cross and which when they pass that line they are beyond the grace and mercy of God. This is what he wrote. There is a time we know not when, a place we know not where, which marks the destiny of men to glory or despair. There is a line by us unseen which crosses every path, which marks the boundary between God's mercy and His wrath. End of quote. There is no sin committed yesterday that the Lord would not forgive today. We say this because he died for men's sins. But as the poem says, there is a line that crosses every path, a line that is unseen, a line that marks the boundary between God's mercy and wrath. And when a person crosses that line, he is beyond the grace and mercy of God. The Holy Spirit's main ministry is to testify of Jesus. This is why the Lord himself said in John 15 verse 26, He will testify of me, referring to the Holy Spirit. When the testimony of Jesus is fully and finally rejected, 
one has truly blasphemed the Holy Spirit and essentially called him a liar in respect to his testimony about Jesus. The religious leaders were close to doing this. To reject Jesus from a distance or with little information is bad. But to reject the testimony of the Holy Spirit about Jesus is fatal. It will not be forgiven him either in this age or in the age to come. And the eternal consequences of the sin should force us to regard it seriously. So how can a person know if he has blasphemed the Holy Spirit? Well, like I said earlier, if you're concerned about committing this sin, it shows that you're not guilty of this sin. Not yet, anyway. But continued rejection of Jesus, or even continually lying to yourself and to others that you are saved when you know deep down that you are not, when you know deep down that you're just, you know, playing the part. Continual rejection of Jesus will make a person's heart hardened against him. And it places that person on the path of full and final rejection. And I am very concerned for those who grew up in church. We have that. And I pray that you had not yet crossed the line. You see, there are those who heard the gospel even when they were young. They memorized verses. They know John 3.16. They can explain to you the gospel. But they have rejected Christ. I warn you, there will come a point in your life when you might cross that line. And there is no turning back. So you may hate me for saying this, but that is what Scripture teaches. And I think it's loving for me to warn you all about this. You can play the part. I guarantee you, anybody can play the part. Anybody who is even a pastor can play the part that he's saved. But there is a line. A line that you must not cross. Otherwise, you might come to the point of full and final rejection of the Savior. Now, some people, as a quote-unquote joke, or as a dare, intentionally say words that they suppose commit the sin of blasphemy against the Spirit. In other words, they take it uh, a light thing to joke with their eternity at stake. But true blasphemy of the Spirit is more than a you know, formula of words. It is a settled disposition of life that rejects the testimony of the Holy Spirit regarding the Lord Jesus. Even if a person has intentionally said such things, they can still repent and prevent a, set, a settled or firm rejection of Christ. The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. Not because it is sin too big for God to forgive, but because it is an attitude of the heart that cares nothing for God's forgiveness. It never has forgiveness because it never wants forgiveness God's way. It may want forgiveness on its own terms, but never God's way. I came upon an interesting story about Aaron Burr Jr., Understandably, most Filipinos do not know this man. He was an American politician and lawyer who served as the third vice president of the United States from 1801 to 1805. He is famously known for his conflict with Alexander Hamilton, and, uh, which culminated in Aaron Burr killing Hamilton in a duel in 1804, while Burr was still vice president. Can you imagine a vice president <laughs> figuring in a duel to the death? But many years, well, he did that and, and killed Alexander Hamilton. Uh, uh, yeah, Alexander Hamilton. But many years be, uh, before, 
he became president, he was a brilliant student at Princeton University. And it is even said that for a hundred years, the academic record that Aaron Burr uh, established was never bested in that great institution in Princeton. When Burr on the, was on the campus of Princeton, however, a revival broke out and he was deeply convicted of sin. His roommate was a Christian and his roommate urged Burr to accept Christ. He went to one of his professors who gave him a Bible and told him, Aaron, take this to your room and settle the matter on your knees. But instead of doing that, he tried to shake off the power of the Holy Spirit in testimony to Christ. And finally, in desperation, he cried out, O oh God, let me alone and I will let you alone. He later said that after he said that, all conviction of sin left him. Many years later, Burr met a friend whom he admired very much. The friend said, Dr. Burr, I'd like you to meet a friend of mine. Burr answered excitedly because he admired this man. Any friend of yours I would like to meet too. The friend then answered, I'd like for you to meet Jesus Christ. And when he said that, cold sweat popped out of Aaron Burr's forehead. Burr then related at the age of 19, he said his prayer in which he addressed to God, let me alone and I'll let you alone. And then Burr said to his friend, from that day to this, I have never had one desire to become a Christian. Friends, it is possible for a person to reject the testimony of Christ over and over again until there comes a time when only judgment can come. I like how William Barclay explained this. And I quote, The sin against the Holy Spirit is the sin of so often and so consistently refusing God's will that in the end, it cannot be recognized when it comes even full displayed. Why should the sin be so, forgivable, uh, so unforgivable? What differentiates it so terribly from all other sins? The answer is simple. When a man reaches that stage, repentance is impossible. If a man cannot recognize the good, when he sees it, he cannot desire it. If a man does not recognize evil as evil, he cannot be sorry for it and wish to depart from it. And if he cannot, in spite of failures, love the good and hate the evil, then he cannot repent. And if he cannot repent, he cannot be forgiven. For repentance is the only condition for forgiveness. It would save much heartbreak if people would realize that the one man who cannot have committed the sin against the Holy Spirit is the man who fears he has. For the sin against the Holy Spirit can be truly described as the loss of all sense of sin. End of quote. But please understand, the way to not blaspheme the Holy Spirit is to receive Jesus Christ and to put one's loving trust upon Him today. Not tomorrow, today. Because you don't know when and where that line is. It means to stop rejecting the work of the Holy Spirit in bringing us to Jesus the Savior. Friends, 
if you have not yet come to salvation in Christ, I urge you to listen to Paul's words, who said in 2 Corinthians 6 verse 2, Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So the Pharisees had become so blind by their hatred for Jesus that they overlooked every sign and ignored every effort of the Holy Spirit that demonstrated that Jesus was the Messiah, at least up to that point. The Lord Jesus then continued his condemnation of the Pharisees for their unfounded accusation against him. Thus he said in verses 33 to 37, Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out that which fills the heart. The good man brings out of his good treasure what is good, and the evil man brings out of his evil treasure what is evil. But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall, for, they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. There are probably some people who must have marveled at this dispute over Jesus' healing of the demonized individual. Christ's act was obviously good. But how could anyone criticize it and even label it, label it as coming from the devil? So people must, who heard this argument must have thought that. So the Lord points out that the heart was the breathing ground for the Pharisees' hostility. Their words were unkind and spiteful because they come from hearts that were full of such things. So he traces it now to the content of their heart or to the condition of their hearts. Why did they say, why did they say that Christ's work was of the devil? Because of their hearts. And when the Lord said, either make the tree, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad, for the tree is known by its fruit, right there in verse 33, this is actually an axiomatic truth, or it is truth that is taken for granted. That the Lord so this is an axiom, axiomatic truth that the Lord uses to call attention again to the illogical accusations of the Pharisees. The verb make, right there in verse 33, is in the sense of consider it to be. Alright? Thus, the Lord's point is that the tree and its fruit must be considered either good or bad together. In effect, Jesus is saying, either Consider me and what I do as good or consider what I do as bad. What I am will be known by what I do. So in effect, that was what Jesus was saying to the Pharisees. In other words, who Jesus is must be determined by what he says and does regardless of personal feelings. And Jesus' words and works point undeniably to His goodness and divine power. The quality of the fruit is the reflection of the tree that produced it. And the fruit of the Lord's ministry was good. Therefore, they could not deny that. They could not deny that it was good to cast, out, uh, to cast demons out of people. They could not deny that uh, they cannot deny that and maintain their theological posture by saying that Christ is of the devil. As a result, they were stuck with the fact that if Jesus did good things, then he must be a per uh, he must be a good person. They had to be consistent with their argument. And so the Lord exposed them again here. The Pharisees could be exposed so easily because no matter what they tried to parade, their evil hearts were so vile and so wicked that their reasoning was absurd and illogical and selfish. From there, the Lord Jesus now gets 
even more personal with the Pharisees and says that their evil works have come from the treasure of their evil hearts. And this is how he put it. You brood of vipers. How can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. The word for vipers in Greek is echidna. And it lit literally, it refers to an adder or a small poisonous snake that was common in Palestine and other parts of Eastern, the Eastern Mediterranean. Because they looked like dried twigs when they were still, a person collecting wood for a fire would often pick up one inadvertently and be bitten. That's what happened to the Apostle Paul on the island of Malta, if you remember in the book of Acts. Vipers, therefore, had the undeniable reputation of being both deadly and deceitful. This was an appropriate description of the religious leaders who were both deceptive and deadly to the spiritual health of those who listened to them. These men would poison men's hearts and minds and damn both themselves and their hearers to eternal hell by way of their teachings on works righteousness, legalism, etc. And like a brood, these men tended to travel in groups from place to place, spreading their poison. This is why later the Lord said in Matthew 23, verse 15, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel around on sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. So that was what they were doing. They were going around spreading the poison of their false teachings and false theology. Now, having already cut them to the quick by referring to them as vipers, the Lord Jesus now diagnoses the problem. Where did the hypocritical self-righteousness and soul-damning teaching come from? The answer, it came out of the treasure of their hearts. The Lord said that the mouth spoke what filled the heart. The word fill, right there in verse 24, means treasury. The English word thesaurus is derived from that word. Hence, thesaurus means a treasury of words. So, a person's heart is treasure of all his thoughts, emotions, and will. It is a treasure of all his attitudes, desires, ambition, loyalties, beliefs, and opinions, which all reside there, and from the mouth draws its words and expressions. It is self-evident, then, that a heart of good treasure brings forth good things in what a person says and does. Likewise, a heart full of evil treasure brings forth evil actions and words. This is the same point made in James 3 verse 1 when it rhetorically asks, does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? The quality of what is in a person's heart determines what comes out of the mouth. Now, I would like to point out that in the Bible, the figurative use of heart is not used in the same way in today's English language. When we say heart, we usually refer to the seat of emotions, right? We use it even to express how we feel. However, in the Bible, we find that the stomach was used to refer to feelings, while the heart was used to talk about the seat of the mind and the will. So a person with an evil heart is not someone with negative emotions or negative feelings, but someone who has evil thoughts, which in turn will produce evil attitudes and negative emotions. 
Jesus was very pointed in telling the Pharisees that their evil accusation against him comes from their evil hearts. Their thoughts are controlled by their pride and not by God. They think in terms of themselves and what they may or may not gain rather than in terms of what is good for the kingdom of God. Simply put, an evil mindset produces an evil tongue. Similarly, Jesus says that people act according to their nature. If the heart is full of hate, the mouth says hateful things. The Pharisees slandered Jesus because their, their hearts were filled with slander and hatred. Now let me bring this down to our situation today. We gossip and criticize others because our hearts desire to promote self by condemning others. Of course, we try to disguise our harsh, harsh speech. After all, that's not nice. Thus, we call gossip news or even a prayer concern para spiritual. We call our criticism analysis. We speak abusively. If we speak abusively, we try not to do it publicly, but we utter our worst talk when doors are closed. We think it's safe to speak harshly in private. But this is a mistake. Why? Because speech has a way of becoming public. Certainly you know the saying, right? The walls have ears. But more than that, Jesus says that God hears every word. So even if you say it out there or you say it in, in close, behind closed doors, it's not like you're, you're free of that sin. It's not like you've not committed wrongdoing before God. You have. Even if people have not heard about that. Jesus knows. Jesus says God hears every word. For this reason, the Lord said in verses 36 to 37, and again, this is a warning, but I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Now, is the Lord Jesus saying that you are saved by what you do and by what you say? The obvious answer is no. Salvation or justification is not produced by either words or deeds, but the words and deeds are clear manifestations of salvation. They are the objective, observable evidence of a person's spiritual condition, whether it be good or bad. We are not saved by good works, but we are saved for, all right, for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Ephesians 2 verse 10. In the same way, true salvation also produces good words. Hence, we read in Romans 10 verse 10, For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. In Romans 15 verse 18, Paul, Paul's praise to the Lord was that the gospel result, resulted in the obedience of the Gentiles in word and deed. So if you're saved, you can't just be speaking words that you used to say before you came to conversion. You, when, I was, when I was not yet a believer, you know, you, many of you have heard this, I would curse a lot. Now, anyway, when I'm happy, I curse. When I'm sad, I curse. When I'm angry, I curse. When I'm when I'm just doing nothing, I curse. I mean, it's just, it's just like that, like that. Well, that was how I was. And I think somebody in, in the last uh, two or three, uh, in the last three uh, baptism where they shared the testimony, highlighted that, that that person used to curse. 
Well, if you're a Christian, Paul said that obedience comes to a converted person in word and deed. Bear in mind that salvation includes regeneration of the heart in which the individual is transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. What was once dead in trespasses and sin is made alive unto God. The treasury of the heart therefore is changed and thus salvation will result in good words or good speech. Words that confirm the reality of what has taken place in the heart. By the same token, evil words, bad words, careless words mark what is really in the heart of the individual. And so it is by them that they will be judged. They are the confirming evidence of an evil heart. God is a holy God and that is why judgment must come. God is also a just God and will judge fairly and accurately by the very words people say. He will not need witness to verify the truth. The words of the individual himself will verify along with the record of the person's deeds the truth of what his heart is like. Thus, Revelation 20, verses 11 to 15, records the great white throne judgment in which all who have not received redemption from sin that is offered in the Lord Jesus Christ will stand before him. And it says in verse 12, be judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And then, verse 15 of Revelation 20 adds, If anyone's name is not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now, for the true Christian, there will be an accounting as well. Paul writes in verse 10, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Take note, we must all appear. So he's talking to Christians, including himself. So that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Of course, these judgments will not be in condemnation. For Paul had already written in Romans 8 uh, verses 1 to 2, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. The condemnation is gone. But there will be an accounting for what we have said and done, whether they be wood, hay, or stubble, which will be burned up, or gold, jewels, and precious stones, which will reap rewards in heaven, as pictured by Paul in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 12 to 15. So, there will be that day of accounting, my friends, even for believers. What are these careless words Jesus speaks of? Well, the basic meaning of the word is useless, barren, unproductive, or that which does, not, does, or that which does no useful work, and is therefore ineffective in producing any good result. These words include flippant speech, irresponsible speaking, inappropriate talk, as well as words of hypocrisy. The scriptures are full of warning about our speech and include as evil words those that express lust, as you read in Proverbs 5, verses 3 to 4. God also warns against deceit, Jeremiah 9, verse 8. Cursing and oppression. Je Psalm 10, verse 7. Lying. Proverbs 6, verse 12. And Proverbs 12, verse 22. Words of destruction. You know, threatening people. Proverbs 11, verse 11. Words of vanity. 2 Peter 2, verse... 2 Peter 2, verse 18. Flattery. Proverbs 26, verse 28. Foolish speech. Proverbs 15, verse 2. Verbosity. Ecclesiastes 10, verse 14. 
Verbosity is simply saying too much. You know, may nakalimutan na, ah, bakit may nakalimutan na, da, 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 da. That's verbosity. That's sinful speech. Falsehood. Titus 1, verse 11. Pride. Job 35, verse 12. Vulgarity. Colossians 3, verse 8. Hatred. Psalm 109, verse 3. And of course, gossip. Proverbs 26, verse 20. Careless speech is anything that does not fit the injunction in Ephesians 4, verse 29, which says, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. So let me ask you, how careful are you about what you say? This, my friends, should be a sobering passage for all of us but especially for non-believers who will face a judgment of condemnation. Their words, both those evil by deliberate design and those evil by carelessness, will testify against them. That was what Jesus was saying in regard to the Pharisees. But believers should also be serious about this as well. Are we careful, therefore, about what we say? Brethren, there are few of our Lord's sayings which are so heart-searching as this. The truth is, there is nothing to which we pay less attention than our words. We go through our daily routine, speaking and talking without thought or reflection. And we seem to imagine that if we do what is right, it matters little what others say. But is this so? Are our words so trivial and unimportant? Will we, we will not affirm this, especially with a passage like this before us. However, as we have learned, our words are evidence of the state of our hearts. Our lips only utter what our minds conceive. And we will give an account for each and every one of our words on the day of judgment. We shall give account of our sayings and our doings. On the day of judgment, what our heart is like will matter most. Our hearts, especially our careless or unplanned words, will reveal our heart condition. To be specific, in the context of our passage, the good words are words of faith in the Savior who delivered the man who was demonized. A good heart, therefore, declares faith in the Lord Jesus Christ first, and then our casual words slowly change, or our everyday speech slowly change as the Spirit sanctifies us. What we say about the Lord Jesus and His works reveal who we are, and we are judged accordingly. So, let us be humble as we ponder this passage, even as we recall the words and deeds we said and did in the past. And let us also be watchful as we consider this passage about our words when we look to the days ahead. Let us resolve by God's grace to be more careful over our tongues and how we use them. Let us pray daily, according to what Paul said in Colossians 4, verse 6, that our speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt. Let us learn to pray with David also, who said in Psalm 141, verse 3, Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth, Keep watch over the door of my lips. Let's pray. Dear God and Father, thank you for once again teaching us through the work of your Holy Spirit. And we pray first of all, dear God, that you might have mercy on some of us here who may not yet 
com- may not have yet committed their lives to you. I pray, Father, for your mercy upon them. And I ask their God that they might not cross the line that will doom their fate forever. And I pray, Father, that in your mercy, they will realize that they need you as their Savior. And I pray, dear Lord, also that because of this, they will honor you even with their speech. Help us also, that those who are already with you, are your children already, by faith in Christ. Help us, dear Lord, so that our speech will be honoring to you. Forgive us, dear God, if over the past few days we have been careless with what came out of our mouths, we even justified what we said in our hearts. Forgive us, dear Lord, and help us, dear Lord, so that, as the psalmist said, we might learn to guard, put a guard over our mouth, and to keep watch over the door of our lips. We desire this because we want to honor and exalt our blessed Savior. We give you praise and thanks for everything that you've done throughout our time here. And we entrust to you each one, and every family represented here. And we pray that in all our de- endeavors, in all our tra- trips or work, you will be honored and you will bless your people. Till we come again as one body a few days from now. We give you praise and thanks in Christ's name. We have a few announcements. So, uh, before you go, yes, I'm waiting for that. All right. So, we have three first timers. Uh, we'd like to welcome you. No, I'm sorry, four. JV Balahana. Theodore Serrano, Juan Concan, and Jessica Lazano. If you're still here, please stand up and, and be recognized. We'd just like to give you a warm uh, hello. All right, so sila po yung mga first-timers, and we are so glad that you're here. We trust that uh, we, this is not the last time that we will see you, and may the Lord bless you. For announcements for today, help my unbelief Praying Through Our Doubts is the midweek uh, series uh, for the month of May. So, uh, there are just a couple of Wednesdays more. And if you have a prayer request, we'd like you to write them down on pieces of paper. Email them at hscc.payforme at gmail.com or you can send an SMS to 0917889 So, help my unbelief, Praying Through Doubts. Uh, that's our midweek prayer service from 7.30 to 8.30 p.m. via Zoom. Man in the Marketplace also presents the Disciple Making Dad, May 21. Uh, the fellowship starts at 7 a.m., so BF Homes, Quezon City Clubhouse. I will be the speaker there, so you can, hey, you can ask me questions. Uh, you can ask me questions if you want uh, about uh, about parenting or discipling your children and this is a very very important aspect and you dads you dads will be held accountable and I'm not kidding you will be held accountable before God with what you do with your children and I'll explain all of that and if you have questions again like I said if you have questions you can feel free to you feel free to ask so uh, uh, that will be May 21 Saturday at the BF Homes Quezon City Clubhouse. I don't know what time the teaching starts. I think it starts like 9 o'clock. Okay, so um, be there. I hope you can be there. Independent. Singles and the home. So this is the Solo Cristo theme for their gathering on May 21 at 3 p.m. Dito po sa HRCC Center. So... Rico Bautista, brother Rico Bautista, one of our leaders, will be the speaker. Independent, singles, and the home. Again, we're announcing our annual membership meeting, so please mark this out in your calendars. June 4, uh, from, uh, that's a Saturday, 1.30 to 4.30 p.m. Okay, so uh, please come because we will be welcoming, we will be extending the hand of fellowship to our brethren. So if you're a re- registered member 
you are requested to be here. You are a regular member already. Be here and witness as we extend the hand of fellowship to our new members. And as they sign in the Lamb's Book of Life. Okay, the red book. Hindi ko alam kung nakapirma ako doon eh. Anyway, so please be informed about our annual membership meeting June 4, 1.30 to 4.30 p.m. Uh, see you there. Uh, we have a final song, so please rise. redeemed honor praise glorify and worship you amen good morning pop <laughs>